Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, it's always terrifying to start these things off because there's an open door that I can run out of super easy that way when I'm walking up here. But um, first, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody taking some time out and coming here to hear me babble on for a few hours and do some interpretive dance. It's going to be great. Um, but I also just wanted to say uh, thank you to all the donors and everybody here that really is trying to support this idea of this creative culture and that, uh, you know, that cultural voice that's so important to any city across the U.S. And I have to say something else. Uh, Stephen and Emily Riley have been long-term friends and supporters of mine. And part of my, really honestly, love for Louisville came from seeing the good work that a lot of people are doing here, including them. And it's always been really inspiring. And not in a creepy way, but we're watching you guys. And, um, and it's just part of the reason why I really made it a, an intention to somehow get back here and do work. Um, so no one told me how to move things forwards. My hands are shaking. So hold on a second. So, like um, Ben, and thank you, Ben, for doing that. And how do I move forward? I got it. Um, <laughs> got it. Shit, where's that door? Um, I am a fourth-generation farmer, and this is a picture of my grandfather and my father. And we've been farming in the uh, West Valley of Phoenix since the early 1920s. And that, over that course of that time, we've grown everything from alfalfa and cotton to kohlrabi and bok choy. Um, and there we go. Um, currently, we grow carrots and parsnips. And I like to kind of joke that I figured it out the other year. Like, over the last 12 years, we've grown enough carrots to basically go from here to the moon and back about five times. And um, the thing about farming and risk as you can imagine, is that farming is such a unique, such a unique thing that we're, we're, we're separated in so many ways, which I'll get into, but my dad told me we're, we're kind of like gamblers, you know, is that every season we have this handful of seed, and it's like, this is the year, you know, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it this year. And then you put that seed in the ground, and then the first storm comes, and then the irrigation, so, and then it sort of like slowly eats away at it, and at the end of it, hopefully you have something. And then the next year, you got a handful of seed, and you go, this is the year, I'm gonna do this again. And continually, it's a, there's some uh, inherent thing that keeps on pulling us back. And it's powerful to feed people. And although I grow 250 acres of carrots, and I've never once really seen one of my carrots in a supermarket. Even that disconnect exists. It's still one of the most powerful endeavors that I find out in the world today and that we desperately need to understand and be connected to. And so when I went to go get my degree in economics and, ag and agriculture, I couldn't stay awake in macroeconomics, so I ended up taking an art history series. And that was pretty much it. You know, that was a difficult phone call to make my dad, though. I was like, hey, dad, sorry, I'm, I'm an art history major. Um, let me know how the farm works out. Um, <laughs> but but what, what ended up happening is, is, is this. And we are still in, in the midst of of encroachment. You know, it's a narrative that's a global narrative that we've all heard of, of this continual, you know, basically erosion of that rural, rural landscape and lifestyle by, by development. And I, when I was in art school, it was really difficult for me. I was in San Francisco, and I was coming back to the farm, and I was trying to get an art practice, and I was on the trying to go to either LA or New York or whatever, whatever that program is, is that we feel like is the, the path that we're supposed to take. And I went back to visit home, and this is what I saw. This is about you know, two miles away from my farm. And at the time, this is around 2003 and four. they were taken down you know, 60 acres in six months. And so I was, well, I just didn't know what to think about it. I mean, everybody just like, get your pitchforks out and go storm the developers. But I, uh, 
I took that chance and embraced this thought of being an artist. And how, how, how can you look through that? Almost like how a filmmaker would say, like, I look through the lens to separate myself, right? How do I take one step back and really look at what this is? And so this is the beginning of the journey of my work. And, and what I'll say is, is that what I try and do is ask questions, you know? And, and, and one thing I learned in farming is, is that you, you never figure it out. Anybody that says that they have figured it out, they're full of it. And that, that's okay. And that daily risk, that exploration creates such innovation and, and wonder in a daily life that it becomes work that's a lifelong endeavor, an exploration of our world and looking for where the beauty is. And to look for that hope. Because the one thing that's not risky is hope and we need it. And so that's the end of my uh, heavy lecture in the beginning of this process. <laughs> um, but when I first came back, what I really wa was doing is uh, trying to understand this new landscape. And so what I did is I went around to all the developers and I collected all their little like, you know, pamphlets for homes. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to one of these places, but they, they all have brand names. So this was the Destiny House or something like that. So they all have these like really funny, yeah, they, anyways, you, they don't think they're funny. It's, but it's good marketing. Um, uh, so what I did is I, I, I rented this 20-acre uh, field and I put this drought-tolerant bar barley in it. And I, I grew it up and I, I carved this 900 by 450 single-family residence out of it by hand. And, partly just because I'm totally nuts, but also I, I, I needed that moment to look through the lens and step back and say, what is this and what does it mean? And so we're going to watch me work with a hoe for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> and I want you to notice my technique, very, very elegant, smooth strokes, no, um, that what, what, uh, what I was really thinking, this is a performative action. I did document it, and I didn't really know what I was going to do with it at the time. But it, it, there's an art historical reference here, which this is a piece by Gustave Courbet. And this is called The Stonebreakers. And there was a moment in, in art where we moved out of uh, uh, romanticism into realism. It was a really powerful moment in art history. And, and Courbet really got beat up about this. But what he was looking, is shining a light on is this, that there's something like so endlessly tragic and hopeful. I mean, you know, just tragic about Stonebreakers. Seems like the most, why, what's, what's the end game on that? And, we, you know, I mean, that's a really simplified way of looking at it. But for me, as, as carving this image out of this field was to recognize of my place in this puzzle. All right, you know, and so as, as a farmer in the desert, middle of the desert, we basically laid the foundation for development to happen. If you look off into the distance, all those fields are just home sites. And so I took that moment to use that work to go, oh, okay, well, if I'm going to be mad at developers, then I have to be mad at myself because we're part of that system. And if you want to upend suburbia, then you have to upend the entire economic infrastructure that we've created to enable that kind of growth. And it also allowed me to start to look for not the problems anymore and to try and think about, again, just questioning what the future might look like. And so I started to look at our own methodology. Now, just to be clear, I mean, I, I've grown conventionally, I've grown organically, and um, but uh, the majority of my family's practice has been in what we would call a large-scale ag agricultural model. So this is radishes. And so what I started to look at is that radishes, basically I can tell you exactly how many I can get out of a field. I know what size they're going to be. They're all going to be perfectly round and red so you guys don't freak out when you go to the grocery store. It's your fault. <laughs> um, but uh, what I started to realize, though, is that this system that we use is really familiar when you start to look at that. 
So not only is there visual recognition between the two systems, but there's also a vernacular rec you know, similarity. And that is that when I was going to these zoning meetings with the city of Surprise, which is the name of the town that my family's farm is in, Surprise, no farms, um, <laughs> the, that, you gotta laugh. It's the only way to be, <laughs> otherwise, I'm just gonna cry. Um, that what, what you would hear in there was just this, oh, how many houses per acre, how many, can we get out of it? Three houses, seven houses, and I what I realize is that they're negotiating yield. The same thing that we negotiate here. And so we're all in this same system together, trying to figure it out. And so the next piece I did was, I, my grandfather sold the first piece of our family's property to a developer, and I went to the city and I got the planned area development. And then I GPS the exact replica on an adjacent field and grew all the houses out of sorghum and, and wheat. And, um, which is a totally bad idea. Um, <laughs> so it took a year and a half. And the thing is, sorghum is actually, I didn't realize this, of course, because I always chop it down and plow it on the ground, but it's a perennial. But in the middle of the, um, season that whole the whole eastern development was blown away by this terrible frost storm you know and so it was like a really interesting moment where i didn't tell anybody about this work you know and i was just kind of out there doing it and fingers crossed that when you get into a plane my dad's a pilot and he would fly around and every time you take off your i was well your butt would clinch up because not only because my dad's flying but <laughs> Because you never know what this is going to look like, you know, and then he's, did I get the roads off or anything like that, but it just got lucky. And what happened, though, from this work is really to be able to look at the past and future of the place and not judge it, you know, to allow that to exist and understand that this is what happens, right? And, and, and where do you go from that? And the most powerful thing about this work in the, in, in the end was is that it ended up in an environmentalist wall as well as a developer's wall. And they both thought it was beautiful. So art has that unique capability to sort of navigate these, these fine lines where in a lot of other sectors we're, we're not allowed to insert ourselves. And so do you really use that power to, to, to you know, keep on trying to find the thread? And so lastly, I'm kind of like zooming out, but started to try and figure out Again, why this makes sense and trying to understand Phoenix specifically is like a place you should shine a, shine a spotlight on if we look at sustainability and resiliency as a community as well as the development, all that kind of stuff. There's already a, you know, a, there's a historic base for the HOCOM that vanished. And we talk about that, but really what happened is, is that they, they, comp they continued to overuse their finding through you know, all the archaeological research that they basically grew themselves out and you know, tainted the soil. And so it's a part of this narrative in that area. So it's really interesting to sort of see what we're doing there and try and take two steps back and going, holy crap, I hope we haven't made a horrible decision. Or, you know, isn't it amazing what we can do? So that, that canal in the background is a central Arizona project. It runs from the Colorado River all the way down to the Tucson, 90 miles. And you get up into 1,000 a, a feet and you look at it and it's unbelievably beautiful. This mirrorized line just traveling through the starkest desert. And it, there's such hubris in that. Right? That we would do that, to think that, you know what we'll do is we'll drag this water all the way into the desert and live. And it's beautiful. And I know no, mostly people don't say like hubris and beauty, but there is something about the human condition that uh, we'll figure it out. So I started to sort of see like, you know, I start with this big bummer picture of suburbia, but then now it's like suburbia is beautiful if you get step back far enough. And now as a human endeavor, there is this, you have to sort of be able to look at that to try and understand it differently and not just make your decision and walk away from it. So how can we invite ourselves to understand that methodology and why it makes sense to us? And understand that those reasons of building home, of building a community, aren't 
the problem. It's the systems that we would choose to get there maybe be on the wrong path. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I don't know what I'm doing. All right, see you later. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so then I wanted to really move this process and try and invite people into, because, you know, again, I kind of talked about that agriculture is a really nice connection point to reconnect on these things that why are we making the decisions that we're making maybe because we're not really connected to the land the soil itself and to understand as a farmer what what we really the soil needs an intention of a century not of the end of the business year so when we're cultivating land that methodology is a revolution to a you know contemporary society where we want we want results now, you know, we want results quarterly. And so when you look at an agrar agrarian scale, which is also why it's so scary about the future, is how do we teach that? How do we teach, how do I teach, how do we teach our children to, to understand that, hey, take on this job as a farmer, but your great grandkids are the ones who are gonna realize your work. And every, every little hoe pass that you do is really about them, it's not about you. And that conceptually is, it's so hard for us to handle now. And that's something that we all have to work on. So as a part of this, this is called the Urban Transplanter. I did it outside of uh, Pasadena and it was a vacant lot that the city had and I didn't do anything for 25 years. And so I put this 100 foot long conveyor belt that went over the course of two weeks over the path of that lot. And what would happen was is that it would distribute little lettuce transplants. And so it was supposed to be up for a few months and it ended up being up for two years and we distributed 14,000 seedlings in this small community. And there's, there's it's just, that's just awesome, you know, like, and they never disappear. I thought that there were just gonna be a big pile of, you know, lettuce plugs all over the ground. This being said, those are perfect for marijuana transplants. So I'm a little <laughs> bit dubious that somebody wasn't like, all right, I'm free. Um, but, that just gesture of a communal engagement. So we're taking art now out of these photographs and then the artwork becomes a completion of that from the community and not really knowing what's gonna happen. And that risk that you take that you put something out there and hopefully it's completed and it's taken somewhere else that you wouldn't really understand where it would go. And so I really tried to follow that thread and try and figure out where else can I push this idea where, where art can go. And where's a place that, in terms of a built-in audience, is no better place than the supermarket? Everybody's gotta go grocery shopping. Well, they used to until that app, Amazon thing. But, but what I really wanted to do is try and invite this reconnection to the land in that space where we make the decisions that are kind of upending that whole entire concept. So if I told you, and no farmers allowed in this question, how many days do you think it grow, takes to grow a carrot? Just pop out an answer. 40 days. 40 days. So it takes me 160 days to grow one, my carrots. 160 days. You think about how much water that is, how much labor that is, how much sunlight. And what we think when they get in a 160 day cycle, what we do, one carrot. And then when you go to the grocery store and you pick that carrot up, how does it change the way that you think about the food that you're eating? And how do we introduce those ideas without you feeling like shit? <laughs> And although from a farmer perspective, that's kind of fun, sometimes a little enjoy, no, I'm just um, And what I started doing is filming everything I grow from seed to harvest. Now at this time, we had the other part of my career that was to figure out a farming model that made sense, right? Because we're transitioning out because of suburban encroachment. I'm looking at community supported agriculture models some sort of model that makes sense outside of, you know, the Hudson Valley and Napa, right? What, when I open my QuickBooks of a conventional practice and I look, open the QuickBooks of a small farming, and then at least there's some path to give farmers and the, to the future where they can build a life. And so uh, as we were doing, so there's 70 different varieties of vegetables that we grew, some not that well, some better than others. And, I would film them. And we made these films and they debuted as a part of an exhibition for Sundance, but I asked for the supermarket to be where we put them. 
and which is kind of smart because it was open 24 hours a day, so I had like a two-week screening that went endlessly on. And, but when people went to walk up and you know, buy a squash or a head of lettuce, they would see this. So at the end there, squash, 55 days of harvest. Super simple. I did all these like heavy conceptual projects, land art, and just to turn a camera on that connects us so simply and wonderfully to our planet, our earth, where we are on it, how we are part of a system, the life cycle, and how powerful art can be that in that moment that of, of, of wonder, wonderment in that work, that all the BS that we find ourselves in can wipe away for a minute. And you have a common platform to start a discussion or a realization or to upend a, a, a supposition that somebody might have. And that's the work from a creative standpoint is what we're all here about. So how does infin in innovation come out of those moments and out of that practice? These kids watched broccoli grow for 18 minutes. <laughs> and their dad wandered around and tried to shop, and you can tell because there's a six pack in the bottom of that cart before, <laughs> before he even hit the vegetable department, which is difficult to do. At the last turn of it, I was in there and it was like, oh, broccoli again? So, uh, there, I mean, it does have its limits. Uh, this is my son. I'm going to get torn up. But... And at the end of the day, basically, I don't know what the world looks like for him. And All the things that were so important to me as a farmer and growing up in this connection to land, I'm the fourth and last generation to grow on my family's land. And that narrative happens over and over again. And however poignant that is for me, standing in front of you getting teared up about it, is, is what we face as a global community. And when we think about things like climate change in our environment that, and also even the work that is done in our spheres, that we're, art is this, is, this is, this is work for me, an artist, and, 
and that we're trying our best to make the world a better place, right? And we all are in our own ways. And to be able to embrace that and, and be proud of that and really say, hey, I'm here and this is my work. And to get behind that is needed because we need different ways of looking at our world and that's what the arts are so good at. And anyways, these, I mean, it's just so funny because these are so simple. And this is a Nuit Blanche in Toronto, and this is a big projection that I did there. But it, it's like two, thousand, two million people descend in the, the downtown of Toronto, and they have the attention span of gnats. I mean, like, you can't. And at this point, this is about 11.30 at night, and you can smell the alcohol content in the crowd. And these people sat for 45 minutes and watched plants grow. And at the end of them, there would be like this cheer and, I love you squash, you know, like these sort of like. <laughs> and um, and that, I, that's, I just love that it's so, that, that, you know, I'm standing up here to talk to you about my work. I don't feel like I'm the one who made it, so it's just kind of funny. Like, I love seeing work like that have that impact. This is a piece that was uh, a collaboration with a London-based artist, Claire Patey, and, and this is a half-mile-long table that we did. And we, re, we took over, a, basically, a, a street in downtown Phoenix and invited everybody to dinner. Super simple concept. There was a lot of organizations involved, but we thought about 3,000 people show, were going to show up, and 12,000 people did, which actually was kind of stressful. <laughs> <Sucks>. <laughs> but a simple gesture like that, I mean, they had power around food, right, that brings people together. It's things that we do as a global community that we, you know, that's just those, the really powerful moments to try and find that thread and keep on tracing it. And... One of the biggest, riskiest projects that I took on recently was a project for the General Service Administration in the port of entry in Nogales. And so that's what the port of entry looks like when you're coming in from Mexico to the U.S. And how do you, you know, having a review board that's, you know, the Border Patrol and Department of Homeland Security, whew, man, those are rough, those are rough clients. But this piece is a representation of a mountain range that comes from Mexico and goes up into the Arizona. And it's where uh, a lot of traffic basically is coming in. And my family's been in agriculture for, again, over 90 years. And there is a deep connection to, I've been working with the same family from Durango, Mexico for 30 to 40 years. And some of, some of my, my generation, Juan Pablo, Martin, these guys that I know, they didn't, they didn't have any worker permits. And so what I, this is a really difficult topic because I'm part of this issue directly and I never really talked about it. And then in this space that is, it's difficult because it's secure, it's about security, it's about borders passing and whatever your politics are, it exists. And how do we, how do we be able to navigate that and create a space that might have some of those tangents of wonder? And how do we invite people into that experience? And so this piece basically took that mountain range and inverted it and suspended it and created a shade structure that didn't exist for people that were exiting the pedestrian area. Um, and the pathways which are denoted by those little uh, blue pegs are the paths that my friends walked in from Mexico into the US, seven nights, six days. And that um, journey is still going on. And while this piece doesn't really, you know, it's hard, to, it, it's, the piece doesn't solve that, of course. But it inserts it into that discourse at the place, at the context of the site, to try and f figure out a way to find empathy out of that and understanding. And hopefully, as simple as a little shade. And so I'm flying over to an exhibition and, and uh, in Bentonville, Arkansas, and I'm on this plane with somebody, and I was just talking to him, and he said, yeah, I just came up from, it's funny enough, through, through, uh, through Durango, and I said, oh, what port did you go through? And he's like, well, I don't know which one. It was in Nogales. There's two ports in Nogales. And 
He's like, but it was like, it was a really interesting architecture. And there was this crazy cloud thing that I walked under. And I was like, I made that. <laughs> and, and, and he, uh, it was, I, you never had that experience like that. Usually at exhibitions, it's like, oh, hey, great job. You know, like, and everybody was like, you kind of like, but this was one of those moments where it actually had the impact that I was hoping it was had. And, and we work in a vacuum so much. That's the risky things about being artists is that we put so much of ourselves out there and we hope for the best. And what everybody's doing here in a creative practice is risky, but again, it's the best gesture of hope for humanity that there can be, that we look to the world and, 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 and still find a reason to try and drag something new out of it, new perspective, a new idea, a new way forward and new questions. And so, I think it's a really good time for me to stop talking. <laughs> but uh, just, I've done a bunch of other projects that reference the food waste, and this is a project that I did uh, around, in, in 20 minutes on our carrot line, we basically throw away 50 carrots. And so a part of our food structure is basically the aesthetics of our food are too creepy, and those are creepy, I'll give you that. Um, but that we've trained ourselves that the aesthetic is something that we should get away from, you know, and that the challenges that we face as farmers and to, to basically retrain a whole entire marketplace that, you know, oblong radishes are okay, or any, how many farmers are in here? Get out of here! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but this kind of stuff comes out of the ground all the time, as you probably know. And um, it's just, again, one of those points where we have so much work to do to, to achieve the goals that we want to achieve. And, and I just feel like there's, there's some imagery and some concepts that bring us together. And all the work I've done is just trying to figure out to push that edge of how we are supposed to think about what the world looks like. And this is a perfect example in this project I will end on afterwards. So this is a, uh, the LA Aqueduct, which again, there's a theme there, there's a dragging water all in from somewhere into another place. And they asked me to come in and I think they wanted me to talk from an agricultural perspective because farmers blew this up to divert it in the beginning of it. I don't know if you guys know that history, but it's really fascinating. So what we did is we recreated, because originally they actually were building those aqueducts out of wood. And so what we did is we made this 50 foot long, eight foot diameter pipe in this art center. And um, we made it out of scaffolding boards that were recycled. So the great thing about scaffolding boards, again, going back to this idea of building in this history there and that connection that, that there's this patina on it that's basically of the labor and the work that was went into building the structures that we sit in. And there's paint and stucco and wonderful, just, just a wonderful touch into how things are built because it's fantastic. I have no idea, like, you ever think about a skyscraper and then just imagine how all the toilets link together and somehow magically take it. And if you could look at that entire structure, that's beautiful. And that's the kind of connection, the thread of like even 50 days to harvest, those kind of little threads that just try and follow them through to really understand that hopefully the work, and to understand as a human that we're, we're this big, we're this big. Farming does a great job of making you feel that way. Because when you plant 20 acres and you lose it in 15 minutes to a windstorm, you feel this big. And we need that more than ever. To understand that this is a long-term game that we're in. And there's just things that make us feel that big. I mean, there's things that also bring us together that in, from, an, from an agricultural perspective, Nothing that is more hopeful or more terrifying than a cloud. It's, it's all the hope of a rain, but also that little tinge of hope there's not hail there. And there's people 
around the world that are taking pictures of sunrise and sunsets and clouds every day. And so that attraction to beauty and that attraction to understanding our scale is really powerful. And any time that we can touch that and uh, present it to people to understand that that basically that we need to come together on so many things that we're, we find ourselves on other sides of. And I just hope that we all walk away from here and you forget about everything I just said. <laughs> and that we do the work and go out there and do the work because it's important. And it's risky and people don't applaud every time, but it's worth it and we need you. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop there, Ben. You can come up and ask your questions.